right now in the state of Texas, we're under the 2017 version of the NEC. And in September uh, of 2020, we will be going to the 2020 edition of the NEC. Throughout this presentation, I will try to bring to your attention new things that are coming out in the 2020 NEC that may make uh, for some interesting changes out in the field. And your electricians and you and inspectors will have to be up on some of these things. So I will put big, bold letters up on the screen when these are changes that are coming about starting in September. So if you'd like, a lot of those things I get is from this book, the analysis of changes of the 2020 NEC. It's a great reference book. It's about this thick, but it's got pictures and lots of neat things. But uh, it, it expands on some of these things that I'll be showing you. So when it says new to the uh, NEC, this is the book that uh, is a great reference. Uh, yeah. So my first, hey, Wow, 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 look at this. New in the 2020 NEC. Here's a, a little deal here. It's called what? Type one or type two surge protector. The code says in the 2020 edition, starting in September 1st, that all, all new homes must have a whole house surge protector. In this case, here's a picture of one on a house. It's right next to the panel on the outside of the house. The code says it shall be immediately adjacent the panel or built into the panel. They make both types. So you can have, you know, maybe it's covered up or this or that with the door on the panel. But starting September 1st, this is what you're going to be seeing. So a whole house surge protector is a thing required by the 2020 NEC. Alrighty, in addition to the surge protector, another new deal in the 2020 NEC is an emergency disconnect. Some of you may have seen these, maybe your cities that you build in have required these, but now the code requires this. What it is, is if you have a panel, again, if you have an exterior panel where I can open the door, if I'm a fireman and I want to shut off the power, I can come to your exterior panel, flip the switch and kill the power to the house. I don't need one of these. But if I have a panel inside the house, in the garage, in the utility room somewhere, um, then I need an emergency disconnect on the exterior. And all it simply is, is one simple switch, boom, shut it off. That kills the power going into the house and away you go. Uh, generally, this is an, uh, it's a safety thing. Again, uh, emergency services, if there was a fire, if the panel's inside, sometimes they may not be able to find it. Uh, maybe you've got junk piled up in your garage and firemen can't find it because in the house is burning. This is a quick way to disconnect the power to the house. It's a very, very simple system. Uh, just remember that this is going to go again normally where the power comes in. This is a shut off and then from here go to where the panel is inside. Pull straight and go from there. Now here's one thing I wanted to point out about new in the 2020 NEC. How do we measure? When I say within six feet, remember from a shower or a tub it's within six feet. When I'm uh, measuring from a sink within six feet, well the code got very specific. It's the shortest distance a cord would go, okay? So if I plug into an outlet here with a six foot cord, wherever that cord can go on a straight line or wrap around or do whatever, if I could wrap that cord at the other end, at the, at the six foot end and hit an outlet somewhere around, that's gotta be GFCI protected. So we're not measuring on straight lines or diagonal. It's so wherever that cord can bend around to reach, that's what that thing's going to be. So we're gonna see that here in a little bit. So now here's another thing they added, including through a doorway. This one's going to be kind of fun. Um, two things come to mind. Um, one is in a bathroom. Maybe it's a hall bathroom. Maybe it's uh, the master bathroom. What if the master bathroom door is right here and I've got a sink and I've got an outlet right here on my left. And to my left further is the door that goes into the master bedroom. Well, right around the corner in the master bedroom is an outlet on the wall. Again, if I plug in here at the sink with my six foot cord, could I go around that door opening and touch that other outlet within six feet? If the answer is yes, that outlet out there needs to be GFI protected. Don't ask me, that's what's in the code. That's 2020 NEC, effective in September in uh, the state of Texas. So and here's the other one including a cabinet door. So I showed you maybe a bathroom door, how that might work. But what about a cabinet door? 
your kitchen sink. You're right here at your kitchen sink. What's underneath you? There's usually a, well, dishwashers are already on a GFCI. But what about the disposal plug? The disposal is plugged in underneath the sink, usually. And now that is probably going to be GFCI protected because I can open the doors, the cabinet doors, and take my measurement from the edge of the sink, in this case from the edge of the sink, to that outlet, less than six feet, I've got to have GFCI protection on that disposal. So this rule on how to measure things, remember six foot rule and open up doors. If you're going to be close, close to a sink, close to a shower, close to a tub, then you're going to have to start thinking GFCI protection. So we already mentioned the disposal. Now remember underneath, the disposal and the dishwasher are usually underneath the kitchen sink plugged in. In this case, he's got the disposal plugged in in this outlet up here. He's got the dishwasher down here and the electrician has labeled each one. You notice this dishwasher is GFCI protected and this disposal is already GFCI protected. They have those little labels on them, those teeny tiny labels that say GFCI. Those things should be on there and let you know. Also, when you have two separate outlets here, they need to be labeled because out on the panel, there are two circuit breakers that say disposal or dishwasher. Uh, I need to know which one I'm turning off. So they have to correspond. That's why it needs to be labeled. Could you easily switch around those plugs? Sure. And then that messes up what's written on the panel. So keep that in mind. So disposals, GFCI protected. Now we're going to get a little crazy. So I'm, uh, yeah, you're looking at the screen going, what? 220 volt forever and ever the code has said 110 outlets shall be protected in these areas this is the first code cycle the 2020 starting in 2020 um, that they're saying 220 outlets shall be protected and we're going to go over a number of these it doesn't say within so far from a sink or anything like that it just says anything up to this much including these 220s will be protected by a gfci is there an outlet with a button? No, it's going to be on a breaker. So the electrician will have to get there. But the first one we're going to see is an electric dryer. So if you have an electric dryer plug, that thing is going to be GFCI protected. Remember the rest of the utility room, the 110 outlets are already GFCI protected. That's the last one. That big 220 is going to be GFCI protected. So since we're uh, messing with that, that's the dryer. Let's talk about this one. What about the range of the oven. If you have an electric range or an electric oven, yes, you've got a big 220 outlet sitting somewhere in, you know, behind the cabinets, behind that range, uh, behind the oven, where that's going to plug in. Or if it's the oven and it's directly tied in, that circuit is still going to be GFCI protected. So these circuits for dryers, ranges, and ovens are going to be GFCI protected. And again, normally they're going to be out on the panel. So look for that. Again, starting in the 2020, we'll see that. So, and then another one. These things are just coming, coming, coming. So talk to your electrician about these changes because here comes another one. This one has never been done before, but now it says that GFCI protection is required for this big baby outside next to your house. So we've already got an outlet next to the AC out there for service. The code talks about that. Exterior outlets are already GFCI protected, so that's covered. That's a 110 outlet. But now this 220 circuit going to the heat pump or the traditional air conditioner or the condensing unit are out here. They have to be on a GFCI. So as we go forward, um, we talked about indoor damp or wet locations need GFCI protection. That's the dog walk washing station. 110's in there, that's pretty simple. But now that's interior, that's kind of a new one. But I wanted to show you this new one because again, it's in the code, but um, GFCI, the wording in the code book is for outlets used for servicing equipment. And that's always kind of been there. That's why we put one out there for the air conditioner outside. But now this one up in the attic is technically for servicing equipment. We've got air conditioners up there. We've got sometimes water heaters up there, uh, dehumidifiers, uh, all sorts of things go up in the attic. And when you have this outlet, this now will be GFCI protected. 
That's just the way. It's a separate little note in the code book. So new in 2020. Now, of all the new things in the 2020 code book for electrical, this one is kind of the most curious because I want to know who's going to do it. Um, it says that the hole cut between the dishwashers over there, and this is the sink cabinet, and we always cut a hole between the sink cabinet and the dishwasher itself. And so what runs through there? We usually run the electrical wire. We run the water supply. The hot water supply goes through there. And sometimes the drain line comes through there. Although sometimes they'll run the drain line now through a separate hole way up high and come down and into the disposal. Um, but that's what that hole has always been. But now what does the code say? It says this hole in the cabinet wall needs a grommet or a bushing to protect the wire. So not to protect the, the water line or the drain line, but protect the wire. So who does that? Does the electrician put it in there? He doesn't drill that hole. Uh, does your appliance installer do that? Does your trim carpenter do that? I don't know. Uh, we'll find out in 2020 when this code comes into effect. But that's the idea. So if I open up the cabinet door underneath the kitchen sink and I look down under there, where that wire comes through, I should see a grommet or a bushing on that hole. So again, it's in the code, so we'll see what happens. Thanks. So as we look forward, new in the 2020 NEC. This is kind of interesting. Let me share this with you. There's a new deal that talks about what I call, again, it's a Davism, the no plug zone. Okay, no plug zone. And it's a zone three feet horizontally and eight feet vertically. And this is going to create some issues for designers as your designers lay out the electrical. Where are you going to put that outlet? Because the code says, here's my tub. Whether it's a tub or a shower or whatever, from the level of this tub or shower, for three foot out, if we're eight feet high, I shall have no outlets. Okay, so here's the deck of this tub. So within three feet of this tub, I can't have an outlet. Well, that covers that sink. I still have a rule that says I need a outlet within 36 inches of that sink. So how can I do that? In this case, I would get lucky. I would probably put it in this knee space in this particular plan. Again, within 12 inches of the top underneath here in the knee space, and I would cover the service for this sink. But there will be times when your designs don't allow anything within that three foot by eight foot zone of no outlets. Now that's new in the code. Uh, before it just says outside of the tub. And now, no, you can't even be near the tub or the shower in this zone, the no plug zone. So keep that in mind starting in September. So look at your tubs, look at your walls. Where can you put outlets that'll serve those sinks? So new in the 2020. So we've got outlets along countertops, and for the longest time, forever and ever, amen, the code, when it comes to an island, has said you need to, to comply with code, all you really need is one outlet, just one. No matter the size, it could be a tiny island, it could be a giant island, all you needed was one to be in compliance. The code's kind of caught up to us. They've changed everything in the 2020 National Electric Code. So starting this fall, there's a new formula for islands and peninsulas. And it's not just a one size fits all kind of thing. So it's a formula and I'm gonna to try to explain it to you here. So there's one outlet for the first nine square feet of countertop. We're gonna use countertop as our guiding light. So if you have a countertop uh, island, if it's technically that countertop is two feet by four and a half feet, that's exactly nine square feet. Uh, or if it's two by four, that's eight square feet. For the first up to nine square feet, you need one outlet. Okay, remember this. So that's our given. We get up to nine square feet, one outlet. So there we go. But now it starts. Here's where the formula comes in. Then one additional outlet for each additional 18 square feet or fraction thereof. So for every 18 square feet, you add another outlet. Okay, so we're going to do a little example here. Have a little fun. So just for fun, we have a 28 square foot island. That's a big island, okay? So it's 28 square feet. We're going to take out, remember the nine feet? We're going to take out the nine feet. 
So that leaves what? That leaves 19 square feet left. Guess what? So now we take 19 divided by 18. That's 1.06. So that's a fraction above. So now for the, I've got one outlet for the nine square feet. Now for this, I need two additional outlets for the 19 square feet. So I have a total of three outlets required on this island. Now it's up to the designer on where to put them. Uh, they can go on the sides, they can go on the face. They could be pop-up models that come up out of the top. It doesn't tell you where they need to go. It just tells you the number that you need to put on it. This also applies to peninsulas as well. So we need three there. So another new in the NEC. This is, uh, I saved this one for last because this is probably the most complicated one, but yet it's so simple, but it may affect a lot of people. It affects this forever and ever. We've had little boxes up in the ceiling. That could be for a light, could be basically for lights, but uh, boxes and ceilings. The 2020 NEC has revised the whole section about boxes and ceilings that some people are, again, I'm just bringing you the message. I don't know how this is gonna shake out, but this is what the code book now says. Here's the actual wording in sections 314.27. Have your electrician look this up, have a discussion on how you're gonna comply with this. 27A2, the first part of this, talks about sealing outlets, okay? That's, they're not plug-in outlets, the box that will eventually hold the light says every outlet used exclusively for lighting, every, meaning every room and hallway, everywhere, boxes shall be required to support a, a luminaire, a light, weighing a minimum of 50 pounds, okay? They're assuming big lights, 50 pound lights. It's kind of like a big ceiling fan, but it's, most of them are already rated for this, and I'll show you some examples in a little bit. But notice they also say in the code, Boxes shall be marked. A lot of boxes I see now don't have a stamp on it that says this box good for up to 50 pounds. They may say it on the box they're delivered in, but it's not stamped in the plastic. And the code is very specific that this is supposed to be on the box itself that's up there so an inspector can look at it and see what it's rated for. Because you can't look at a blue plastic box by itself and know how much it's supposed to support. So that's the start. So ceiling everywhere in the house it says blue plastic box. So what are some of these things? And here's some, I went to a big box store and just took pictures. And here's some, a very basic box, and some bigger, heavier boxes. But they all say, if you were to look, 50 pound light fixture. Okay. So all of them are rated for up to 50 pounds. But when I looked at them in the box, when I looked at the actual fixture, nowhere on it did it say, this is good for up to 50 pounds. So that might have to come around. Um, maybe a different manufacturer might have it on there, but this manufacturer at big box store X didn't have it on there, but they are good for up to 50 pounds. So that's good. So that's lights throughout the house. So up to 50 pounds on the box. Now it gets a little quirkier. Here we go. Just below that section, let's talk about what the code says way in the definitions at the beginning of the book, they've changed the definition a little bit for habitable room. It starts off kind of like before. A room in a building for living, sleeping, eating, or cooking. So I'm thinking family rooms, game rooms, uh, bedrooms, kitchens, dining rooms, breakfast rooms, or cooking, that's, you know, kitchen. And then it goes on to say this, just to clear it up, but excluding bathrooms, toilet rooms, closets, hallways, storage, utility spaces, similar areas. So I'm kind of focusing on these livable room things, okay? Because remember the words habitable room and the definition, because here's where things get weird. In another section, just below the one we read, this is in 314.27C, so we read from A, so now we're in C, and it says, outlet boxes mounted in ceilings of what? Habitable rooms of dwellings. And here it says, in a location, acceptable for the installation of a ceiling fan, ceiling suspended paddle fan, shall comply with one of the following. And then it gives a list, listed for the sole support of ceiling suspended fans, ceiling fans. And later on it says, you know, should hold 70 pounds. Minimum of 70 pounds, that's a ceiling fan box. So what does this mean? So it says 
where a location is acceptable for the installation. So we've always, you know, the one in the middle of the room, no doubt, in a bedroom, a family room, a game room, we've always made that a ceiling fan box for the most part. But now what if we have a can light in my, in my opinion, doesn't meet the rule for this because the can light is its own assembly and it doesn't have, and you're not going to hang a ceiling fan from that thing in the future. So that doesn't count. But we have these things that look like, like can lights, uh, disc lights is what some guys call them. Disc lights are attached usually to a small blue box up in the ceiling at rough. And we might have four, six, eight, ten in some game rooms and other things. And I mean, we get crazy with these things, but they're all attached to a blue box. So it says locations acceptable for the installation of a ceiling fan. That, yes, all those boxes, if they're far enough from the walls, could eventually take a ceiling fan. It doesn't, don't put logic into this. Who would put 12 ceiling fans in a game room? Nobody, but they're not taking that into account. They're just saying, if it's possible, it shall be able to hold the weight of a ceiling fan. So think about that, up to 70 pounds. Now it does say in their illustrated version of their, remember that book I mentioned, the, the uh, book about the changes in the code, they show a picture and they show track lights, you know, a track light thing, 12 inches from the wall. Obviously that blue box that controls that track light, that's too close to a wall. A ceiling fan isn't gonna work that close to a wall. That's what they're using for this acceptable for the installation. That close to wall, that's not acceptable. But anything in, if you could put a 36 or 42 or 48 inch ceiling fan on that box, you know what some people do. After they close, they could do this. So this is the new wording. How many ceiling fan approved boxes are you gonna to have to put in habitable rooms to comply with the code? So again, I don't worry about bathrooms or the kitchen or the hallways, the utility room. Remember the habitable rooms that we just discussed in the definition. So here's the things that we have. They, again, at the big box stores, we're gonna have a ceiling fan box. This is what you see. You know, there, it's for the sole purpose of a ceiling fan. And if you look on it, it's no coincidence, maximum ceiling weight, ceiling fan weight, 70 pounds. So the manufacturers know, and this has been written into the code, so 70 pounds is the threshold that they're using for this thing. So up to 70 pounds. So in my game room with 10 can, you know, pretend can lights, the disc lights that are mounted on a blue box, now do I have to use these? Uh, maybe per what the code says, yes. So talk to your electrician. How will you comply with this brand new wording in the 2020 NEC?